I'm Joe Quinn, and this is the SOT Report. Today I want to talk about Egypt and its relationship to the plight of the Palestinians in Gaza. First, a few facts on Egypt. Egypt is a military dictatorship ruled by 81-year-old General Husni Mubarak. Like so many other dictators around the world, Mubarak was placed into power by the Americans in 1981. Since then, he has ruled Egypt with an iron fist, outlawing opposition groups and individuals and crushing all dissent through torture and often murder. Now, if you live in the Western world, especially in the US, you won't have heard much about this. In fact, any time the American media refers to Mubarak in Egypt, they generally fawn all over him and highlight the good relationship that Egypt has with the US. Without exaggerating, it can reasonably be stated that the governments that are condemned most loudly in the US are generally the ones that stand up for national sovereignty and independence and against US imperialism. The governments that are lauded as close allies, on the other hand, are the ones that are virtual police states. As George W. Bush said a few years ago, the United States has a close and meaningful relationship with Egypt. That relationship is a cornerstone of our policy in the Middle East. So, having donated billions of dollars to the Mubarak regime to facilitate its continued repression of the Egyptian people's freedom, the Americans and Israelis are naturally a little worried about who's going to replace the aging 81-year-old dictator. After all, one tin pot dictator has to be replaced by another. So as you can imagine, if you can imagine how a psychopath thinks, it gives the Americans and Israelis nightmares to think that the will of the Egyptian people might be respected and a truly democratic Egypt might emerge. As regards Gaza and the Palestinians, it's no surprise then that Mubarak toes the neoliberal and Zionist line out of Washington and Tel Aviv. For many years now, Mubarak has ensured that the Egyptian crossing into Gaza remains closed. In doing so, he denies vital supplies to the one and a half million people who live in Gaza. Now, most people have probably heard about the Mavi Marmara, the international aid ship that attempted to sail to Gaza in June this year to deliver tons of humanitarian aid. Most of you also probably know how it ended. The Israelis stormed the defenseless ship in the middle of the night and murdered nine aid workers in cold blood. Hey, that's how the psychopaths in the Israeli government roll. But the Mavi Marmara was just one of several aid ships and convoys that have attempted to break the vicious Israeli siege of Gaza. Most recently, the Road to Hope convoy set off from London on the 10th of October with a few dozen vans and half a million pounds in aid for Gaza. After travelling 4,500 miles through the UK, France, Spain, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia and Libya, the convoy was stopped at the Egyptian border on October 26th because Mubarak, in keeping with his really policy to try and starve the Gazan population, refused to allow the convoy land access to Gaza and insisted that it would have to go by sea. As a result, the convoy leaders had little choice but to secure a ship at significant extra expense and delay. So they wired payment to a Greek shipping company and the ferry arrived. Then, on the night of Thursday the 11th of November, the ferry arrived and the captain lowered the tailgate. But after the very first van drove on with a number of aid workers, the Greek captain began to close the tailgate and then proceeded to put out to sea, ripping the massive ferry along the harbour wall in the process. On board were 10 aid workers and 7 Libyan police officers, all of whom had effectively been kidnapped. Eventually they arrived in Greece, without passports and separated from the rest of the convoy back in Libya. I talked to one of the convoy members, Ken O'Keefe, today in Athens. Ken was on the Mavi Mamara when it was attacked in the night by Israeli soldiers. He is also an ex-US Marine, an ex-US citizen, and now the proud holder of an Irish passport instead. Here's what Ken had to say about the situation from Athens. We've been watching the news pretty closely on, on your progress. What I've been seeing in the media is that you and a couple of the other aid workers on the convoy have been charged by Greek authorities with something. Is that true? Uh, well, the, the, the charge was made by the, by the captain and the owner of the ship, but it was ridiculous, stupid charges. Uh, we, while we were being kidnapped, some uh, one of the two of the brothers wrote on a whiteboard in a marker, the captain is crazy. It's been erased. Okay. Okay. You know, um, and uh, based on that, there was a charge of, you know, uh, criminal damage or vandalism or something. But the prosecutor, the district attorney here in Greece, saw it for what it was, a joke. Yeah. And um, they've released us. The, the, the Greek owner of the ship and the, the captain are in jail right now. Okay. Under 
kidnapping charges. But you you guys are, are, are free to go, basically, yeah? Yeah, we're free. Are you going to be able to return to uh, to Libya, to the, to the rest of the convoy? The problem was that we were kidnapped, and we didn't have our passports. The Libyan government has our passports, and we've now, we've now requested that the Irish consul, or Irish embassy, request that the Libyan government forward the two Irish passports uh -huh. to the embassy, Libyan embassy here in, in uh, Athens. We want to get back to Libya as quickly as possible, and it's unfortunate that the, there's Eid coming up, the biggest holiday in Islam, and so that Libyans are going to be able to hide behind that fact and not send out our passports unless they get it done today. It's probably not going to happen. So we could fly back to Ireland and get new passports, but, you know, that takes a bit of time. And it's a lot of extra expense, you know. Ken, I, I wanted to ask, do you think that there was something more to this than just a crazy boat cap captain? There are a lot of powerful people, you know, in Israel, obviously, who would really like to see the, the convoy not reach Gaza. So, I mean, it just seems a little bit coincidental to me that this major hiccup has happened. We can't discount that possibility. As you say, the, the most powerful people in our world are backing the Israeli Zionist project, mm -hmm. you know, and the Egyptians obviously are collaborating in that, and we, we know the motive is there. We can't prove that that's why it's happened, but it's certainly very plausible. I mean, it's no secret that the Egyptian regime of Mubarak is closely allied with Israel and the U.S. Did they give you any specific reason why they wouldn't let you cross into Egypt from Libya? Well, their policy is that the land crossing is not open to convoys. If you're a tourist, you can drive into Egypt, no problem. But if you're on a humanitarian aid convoy delivering much needed, desperately needed aid to the Palestinians in Gaza, you're blocked. That's their policy. Well, that kind of says it all about the Egyptian government. Well, their, their job is to, to lock the Palestinians in. Let's, I mean, let's just be frank. We all know it. Mm -hmm. The only reason why Rafa was open at all was because of the intense pressure uh, put on the Egyptian government by their, their people. Um, based on the anger from the Mavi Marmara attack in particular. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason why Roth is open at all. Okay, well, listen, Ken, thanks for talking to us. Um, there's a lot of people rooting for you out here, for you and all of the convoy members, and uh, we're going to keep a close eye on your, on your progress, and maybe we'll talk to you again, but um, we wish you uh, Godspeed. Well, thank you, my brother. We, we're certainly doing our best, but yeah, there are very powerful interests putting one obstacle on, on after another in front of us. But we, we will do our best, and hopefully we will succeed. In what I find amazing about all this is that we live in a world where it is ordinary people who have to take responsibility for bringing aid to oppressed people, and that they have to go through such hardships and struggles to do it. Then again, maybe I shouldn't be surprised. Horrified, but not surprised. Because the very fact that the Road to Hope convoy is attempting to bring aid to 1.5 million people in Gaza who are effectively being starved into submission by so-called democratic states like the US and Israel is evidence enough that we live in a world ruled by psychopathic criminals. So all people of conscience need to do what they can to support the Road to Hope convoy. Blog about it, post links on Facebook, check out Ken O'Keefe's Facebook page where you can find details of how to donate via PayPal. In doing so, You'll be helping a humanitarian mission to bring food and supplies to starving children. And you'll be taking a stand against oppression and the crimes of the US and Israel. This is the Sod Report. We'll be back next week. Mm -hmm.